What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? Uh, we're going to be talking about why the separation of church and state has been around since the founding of our country in, in the Constitution, uh, but also why common arguments against the separation of church and state don't really hold up when you consider history. Luckily, we have a guy, Vince Dow, I believe is how you pronounce his name. He is going to be trying to debunk the separation of church and state, considering all of the church and state violations that have been going on recently, namely the coach that's allowed to coerce students into praying to his own death blood god. I, I feel like this is a pretty important thing, and more importantly, the Skeptic Mafia felt like it was important too. So, if you want to fuck around and find out why we definitely have the separation of church and state enshrined in the First Amendment, and why dipshits like Vince Dow will never debunk that idea, then please stay tuned. So we got Vince here. Vince is going to be trying to prove that the separation of church and state don't exist. He's only going to do it in the most disingenuous of ways. So just be prepared for that. Just so that we are all, you know, aware of what the first amendment to the United States Constitution is. It's uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. You know, there's there's a lot in there in the First Amendment. The main part that we're looking at is that the Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, typically what will happen is that people will try to say that it's like a one-way mirror. So basically that the church can influence the state, but the state can't influence the church. But the problem with that is, is that there's a clear wall of separation between the two entities. All the influential people at the time of the Constitution's writing and the First Amendment's writing were all agreed on this wall of separation. Thomas Jefferson, in the letter to the Danbury Baptists, uh, famously called it a wall of separation. And uh, he was just explaining the purpose of it so that the government can't legislate anything against the Danbury Baptists. But... Because it's a wall and not some kind of like weird wall where shit can pass through one way but not the other, the Danbury Baptists similarly cannot influence the government, right? And influence the government would be like legislating the Danbury Baptist beliefs. So a lot of times these Christian evangelical dipshits, uh, what they'll want to say is that this only prohibits the government from establishing a national church. While it does do that, it also means that it cannot legislate theological beliefs of any particular religion, thereby making a law respecting an establishment of religion. Where they get really confused is that sometimes secular ideas about how a society should run, like you shouldn't be stealing shit from people, don't murder your neighbor, all this other stuff, like sometimes those things are also in religions. Like with Christianity, you've got thou shalt not kill right? Or thou shalt not murder. You know, they, they totally disregard the part where that's specifically a law that's given for the Israelite people. It's not like a law that's meant like just for everybody. So they, they totally disregard that. And then thou shalt not steal. Of course, stealing is against the law now. So these are, these are instances where religious mandates in their holy book or their whole uh, or in their theology uh, have actual real world secular value. But what we're talking about when we're talking about not making a law respecting an establishment of religion, we're talking about legislating things purely because your holy book says so. A good example of this would be the blue laws that Texas really wants to defend. These would be the anti-sodomy laws. And these laws are specifically written to give the, the the facade of just prohibiting certain types of sex from occurring. But the effect of the law is to target uh, LGBTQ people, members of the LGBTQ community. That's the purpose of the law. And because these blue laws, there's no reasonable reason, uh, no secular reason why these laws should be on the books. These are theological laws. And just like with Roe versus Wade being overturned, it's not deeply rooted in our tradition and all this other shit. It essentially becomes a theological decision there because they appeal to their God as the reason why they want it overturned. The problem of like, when do, when is a person considered a person? At what point? That's more of a philosophical or theological 
psychological issue. It's it's not uh, something that that you know is going to be you know solved easily through uh, you know various things. Although I think that there's good scientific support for saying that you know uh, a, a fetus doesn't become you know like a baby until it can uh, it can survive outside of the womb on its own. Right? I feel like at that point. That's a good distinction there, because if it can survive outside of the womb all on its own, then that I, th I would consider that to be a whole ass person. We're not here to discuss that exactly, but it is it is a very deeply theological thing. And so these laws that are being made that limit abortion or uh, outright restrict abortion in all cases are theological laws. They only have theological value. They do not have secular value, in my opinion, because they go against science. They go against <laughs> empirical evidence like they go against everything that we have available at, at our disposal it goes against everything all because a book says so. that's a theological law so that's what we're talking about tonight okay just keep that in mind when we're addressing this guy's critique of the separation of church and state so firstly when i say that america is a historically christian nation that is to acknowledge that for the vast majority of American history, America was a nation comprised overwhelmingly of Christian people. Don't give a shit. It really doesn't matter. That doesn't make the United States a Christian nation. When we talk, when we're talking about the United States being a Christian nation, we're talking about the United States, I guess, having an official religion that would be, you know, the Christian religion. Considering that we have religious freedom in this country, that means that this country can't be any one religion. So it's not a Christian nation. This is the kind of wordplay that they use. They play around with the definitions of words. And this is how they do it because they say, oh, by Christian nation, I mean, in the past, people have predominantly been Christian in this country. Well, no shit. The colonies were primarily founded for, you know, very religious reasons. The, the original 13 colonies had uh, various different original religions that were found finding them because they wanted religious freedom. And so they found their own colony and they could implement their own theological state is basically what it was. Um, one of the most restrictive ones was like Massachusetts, uh, the, you know, the Puritan colony. Uh, they had some of the most restrictive laws. Well, in the South, they had to uh, sort of compromise with it a little bit and allow other versions of Christianity to also be included because they had such a need for a workforce down there considering all of the crops that they were doing and, and just the, the kinds of crops that you can do in the South. Uh, it, it's different than in the North. So the colonies were originally set up theologically, like on theological lines. To say that, you know, we're a Christian nation because we're primarily Christian in the past is just a bullshit playing with words kind of game. But on top of that, that is, to fur that is further to acknowledge that our culture, our history, and even to a large extent, the legacy of our politics uh, were shaped by our Christian moral foundations. That is not to say that everyone in American history is or ever has been a Christian. But he's wrong about the Constitution enshrining Christian ideals or Christian morals. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights are so antithetical to the message of Christianity that it's laughable that he even says this. The fact that we even have religious freedom is contrary to biblical values. The fact that we don't mandate that people take Sunday off is a way that, that this country is not founded on biblical values. And the biblical values that are in there have since been overturned, at least until the current Republicans decide they want to segregate schools again and even uh, and regressing even farther back, perhaps even enslaving people again. I tr I really feel like if some Republicans had their way, these ultra MAGA America first fucks, if they had their way, they would repeal the 13th Amendment and start enslaving people. It is instead to say that we have an undeniably Christian heritage that has had no small impact on the founding of this country as well as just the legacy and the history of this country throughout the years. As John Adams argued, the Constitution was written only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So he's quote mining John Adams right there because the fact that John Adams is separating out religious and moral seems to indicate that the religious ideologies at the time 
were not informing morality. Otherwise, those two would be commingled together and Adams wouldn't have had to separate them out. So it's kind of like a conservative self-own right there. Adams, uh, he, he uh, definitely didn't feel that uh, our government was a religious type of government. And I feel like the way that he's talking about this is, is a bit smarmy uh, due to the fact that I, the way that he's going to go with it is more along the lines of, well, we are religious and and so in that way, it informs our laws and government. It, it, it's a nuanced position that he's playing with words that it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So the quote mine here from John Adams is just totally taking it out of context. He's not giving you proper context as to how John Adams felt about uh, religion and government being together. And he's totally misleading his audience. And this is the very expectation and kind of moral framework that our country and our constitution was built upon. Of course, nowadays we are told the lie, quite frankly, that America has always been a secular nation. But prior to two minutes ago, our Christian roots were overwhelmingly understood by most political leaders throughout our history. M most political leaders, really? Like, uh, you know, could, could you actually provide some side? He does go through a few citations, I guess. When we're talking about whether or not we are set up as a Christian nation, we are talking about the founding of our nation. Is our constitution written to be a Christian nation? And the answer is resoundingly no. We're meant to be a secular nation. As far as like our government goes, that's what we're taught when we say a secular nation. We're talking about the federal government. And we're talking about the individual state governments too. Just government in general, as far as our country goes, they are secular. And that's what we, what we mean when we're talking about a Christian nation. If we weren't a, a secular nation, he says that it's a lie that we're a secular nation. If that is indeed a lie, and we have always been a religious nation, it doesn't make sense as to why we would allow other religions to propagate as they do. It doesn't make sense to me why we don't criminalize uh, being of a different faith, because that is what the Bible tells you to do. For instance, the Supreme Court in 1892 declared that, quote, this is a Christian nation. That, that's an interesting little point there. Justice Brewer is the one that uh, said this, David Brewer. He's the justice that said that uh, these and many other matters, which might uh, be noticed and uh, add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Uh, this is the Church of the Holy Trinity versus United States. What David or uh, Vincent Vince here is not telling you that in a 1905 book that David Brewer wrote himself, he said this little point. In fact, the government as a legal organization is independent of all religions. He said that in his book that he wrote, trying to clarify what he meant by this is a Christian nation. And so Vince doesn't tell you this because it's easier to quote mine the court decision. It's easier to do that than it is to uh, correctly represent Justice Brewer and what he meant by that. Considering that Justice Brewer thinks that the government is independent from all religions means that he doesn't think it's a Christian nation. Basically, he's rattling off all of these different quotes from people that it doesn't matter if they consider the United States to be a Christian nation or not. It just simply doesn't matter because they are not the ones that actually set up the government with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The only people that can know what was meant in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, as far as the, in the intent of the founders, would be the founders themselves. And what we have is Thomas Jefferson declaring that there is a wall of separation between church and state. Also considering that pretty much all of the founders set up a secular government, it would seem like there definitely is a wall of separation and we definitely are a secular nation, supposed to be. Woodrow Wilson, who keep in mind was something of a progressive, he was not you know, entirely the most conservative guy in, in some aspects, but even he argued in 1911 that, quote, America was born a Christian nation and believed that America should, quote, exemplify the devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of the Holy Scripture. FDR said that America was founded on the principles of Christianity and led allied soldiers in the singing of the song Onward Christian Soldiers as they sailed across the Atlantic for Fortress Europe during World War II. Even Jimmy Carter, right, Jimmy Carter believed that, quote, we have a responsibility to try to shape government so that it does exemplify the will of God. 
We could do this all day. Yeah, we could do it all day. And the fact is that Carter or whoever else, just because they say it's a Christian nation, doesn't actually make it a Christian nation. What would make it a Christian nation is if in our documents, it says the government of the United States is a Christian nation. We don't have that. In fact, what we have is the Treaty of Tripoli, which is not part of our constitution, but it is a legal document that was written some years later. In the Treaty of Tripoli, it says the United States is not a Christian nation. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So it seems to me like we have far more evidence to say that America is not a Christian nation. In fact, it is a secular nation. He, all he has are later people that are saying their own personal opinions about it. Some fox singing onward Christian soldiers when a, a good portion of our military during World War II was made up by Jews and people of other faiths, not just Christians. But I really would want to hone in on Jimmy Carter's quote because I think that it really somewhat in many ways addresses a modern liberal counter argument of separation of church and state. This is the line that you're very often told. And this is, of course, what most liberals will bring up in response to any arguments of a Christian America, right? The concept of separation of church and state. Liberals have taken this to mean that Christianity ought to have no impact on American life. I do want to correct myself. I, I thought that I read that the Treaty of Tripoli was Signed by Thomas Jefferson. Signature of John Adams, not Thomas Jefferson. Fuck, the Jeffersonian threw me off. It was John Adams. John Adams signed uh, the uh, Treaty of Tripoli, not Thomas Jefferson. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. So he's about to pivot the discussion here, and he's kind of led into that a little bit. The wall of separation of church and state is clearly in the Constitution and the, first, uh, in, in the Bill of Rights of the First Amendment. He's about to pivot it into a very nuanced and specific argument against the whole wall of separation, which is actually a straw man argument. Because what we're saying is that you can't legislate your beliefs, like theological beliefs of your religion and force people to follow your religion, which is currently happening with the Supreme Court. And that the Christian faith should not guide culture in any way or public policy in any way whatsoever. Yet this is not what separation of church and state actually means. The term, which is actually never quoted in the Constitution, by the way, was coined by Thomas Jefferson. And in his own words, this was coined in a letter to the Danbury Baptist Church, described separation of church and state as being a wall to keep actually government from interfering with the freedom of churches, not necessarily from churches or Christians not being able to influence the politics or, or the government or to allow their faith and their principles to uh, guide those politics. So that's not actually what Thomas Jefferson was meaning there. So the entire letter that Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptists is freely available online. You can go and you can check it out. The important part is the second paragraph. And it says, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between men and his God to highlight that for those in the back there that he owes account to none other uh, for his faith or his worship that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Adhering to this expression of the supreme uh, will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in the opposition of his social duties. I reciprocate your kind prayers for the protection and blessing, blah, 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 blah. Um, Thomas Jefferson. So um, Jefferson here uh, is trying to say religion should be constrained between man, a man, a person, and their God. Okay? That's where that lies at. That's where that rests. And so what... Jefferson is trying to explain here is that the state can't influence or force anything on churches or on religions or anything like that, but also the religions can't force their will upon anybody else through the state. So the religions can't influence the state and make theological laws that force everybody 
to follow their particular religion. That's what that means. And so you can't have one without the other. He's trying to have his cake and eat it too. And you just can't do that. What he's essentially wanting to do is he's wanting to sort of cut that concept in half and just say, oh, well, the government can't influence the religion. Okay, that's fine. You want to go that route? Perfectly okay. But you know what that means is that you, a religious person, is a different type of religious person than the Danbury Baptist can't use the government to force their theological concepts or wills upon the Danbury Baptists. And we have a really good example of this that's going on right now with the Roe v. Wade situation. Because in um, Satanic Temple and in uh, Judaism, abortion is allowed and is part of their theological doctrine, okay? So currently, a lot of states, they currently have these laws on the books that are theological laws that ban abortion. Now, they are using the state to force a particular theological position that abortion is bad and is always bad. And even if you're going to die from it, you have to die so your baby can live kind of sentiment. That's a theological thing. They are using the state to push a theological position on people of other faiths and no faiths at all. That's what they're doing right there. And they're trying to hide it behind this secular effort to save the babies. Except they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. If they actually read all of the research and everything on abortion and abortion services and women's health services and all that other kind of shit, they would know that it's not killing babies. They want to push their theological position because ultimately they want a theocracy. And we see this as plain as day in the Texas Republicans platform. The GOP's platform in Texas is a theological platform. And they, I could totally see the na the national GOP taking this up and wanting to push Christian religion on the people. And they, they think they can do that because of America being a Christian nation. So this right here, what this guy's trying to do, he's trying to pave the way for a theocracy. Even if he's going to deny that he's doing that, even if, uh, you know, people come in and it's like, no, we don't want a theocracy. We just want Christianity to, you know, be pushed on everybody. That's a theocracy, dipshit. In short, separation of church and state meant that government cannot stop freedom of religion and government cannot formally establish a state religion, right? So, you know, the U.S. government has no authority to say this is a Catholic nation or this is a Baptist nation or this is, you know, any other religion. But that's basically it, you know. <laughs> I like how the only things that he can come up with are denominations of Christianity, you know? Well, you can't say that it's a Catholic nation or a Baptist nation or a, even a Protestant nation, but it is a Catholic, na a, a Christian nation. It's definitely Christian nation there. <laughs> but but he, th he throws all the other possibilities in with, or any other religion. And he didn't mention other religions. He mentioned one religion. I feel that's a little telling. Oh, no, that's all that the First Amendment says. You know, you can read it. It never says that. Christians can't be involved in politics or that religious motives cannot impact public policy. The only real kind of restriction on religion in politics is simply the fact that, you know, the church cannot formally run the country, right? We're not a formal theocracy, obviously. Really? It's a little hard to tell right now. Now, of course, this was released back in April, I believe. Uh, so it's not most recent, but uh, you know, it's really hard to discern our government right now from a theocracy, considering that you have these six people on the Supreme Court that seem to be dictating our lives right now. They're dictating our lives based on <laughs> Christianity, nothing, nothing of secular value. Tell me what's of secular value to base your Supreme Court decision off of shit that was going on in the 16 fucking hundreds. Huh? How is that applicable? That's like what 176 years before the revolutionary war and even longer than that since, uh, before our, our uh, uh, nation was even set up like how are you gonna base your supreme court decision on something in the 1600s unless it was completely theological in nature it's completely based on christianity not on what's best for this large group of people, not what is best for all people, what's best for Christian people. That's what they made the decision. Enacting laws that reflect Christian morality is not a violation of the Establishment Clause, and the idea that it is is just ridiculous. At the time of America's founding, Christian motives absolutely impacted public policy. Um, 
I, I don't I don't see where it did. This is this is full of conservative cell phones. Because obviously when our nation was initially set up, they got a lot of shit wrong. So if if that's the case, if our nation was set up uh, congruent with biblical values, then that means that biblical values include slavery. Biblical values include treating women as property. Biblical values means that women are less like in the eyes of the state. They are of less value than men. The, and, and, and so many other things uh, are were wrong. So much so, we've had to amend the Constitution. We had to amend the Constitution immediately with the Bill of Rights. So, I mean, it, it just, it baffles me that somebody can be so oblivious to what in the fuck they are saying than Vince Dow right now. Because he's, he's totally painting biblical values as being values of slavery, values of racism, values of bigotry, values of, of hating women. All of these things are apparently biblical values. Do you really want those things to be biblical values? Now, don't get me wrong. I think that our Constitution is probably one of the better documents that has been written. It's allowed itself to be changed over time. The interpretation of it is supposed to be changed. We're not supposed to interpret the Constitution like we're some crotchety old fuck from 1780 goddamn too. Goddamn Clarence Thomas, Alito, Gorsh, uh, the fucking boofer, and the handmaid are the people that I'm talking about right now. I think there's one other justice that's a dipshit too, but... Y'all know who I'm talking about. Don't ever refer to Kavanaugh by his name, by the way. He, or at least I'm not. He will always be the boofer. And th that's how he will always be known to me. Oh, who made that decision? The boofer did it. What's boofing? That's when you shove a bottle of liquor up your ass so that you can get drunk quicker. And then you do a handstand. Is that what one of our justices did? Fuck yeah, bro. Um, sodomy laws, for instance, are a perfect example of this. Those existed in all 13 states at the time of America's founding. Uh, there are plenty more. Okay, so the original founders of the colonies, which is different than when our country was founded, the colonies. So, so these different colonies here, they, they didn't have fun with sex. They had very boring sex. But if you also want to tell me that there weren't motherfuckers in the 13 colonies getting their dick sucked or doing a little filleting, woo, I got to tell you, you will not be able to convince me that them colonists were not doing any kind of cunnilingus. OK, there's just no way. All right. And I sincerely doubt nobody was going up the ass. And I really doubt that there was nobody that was attracted to the same uh, sex. Uh, you know, it's just, it's so fucking weird to think that, oh, well, we got these things on the books here. So that must mean that we're following the moral code of the Bible. It's like, hmm, blue laws or uh, anti-sodomy laws. Those are very theological in nature. That's true. But if you're going to sit there and tell me that people weren't sucking dick or, or, or giving some kind of lingus in there, like, you're going to tell me that wasn't happening? I really doubt it. Really doubt it. Or you can, have, for example, I think a good example would be to research all of the kind of religious, tight, social conservative laws that were in place in Puritan Massachusetts. And, you know, at the time of America's founding, Massachusetts, you could argue, was almost something more or less of a borderline theocracy at the time. No, 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 no. They were a theocracy, okay? It's not, they were kind of a borderline theocracy, just kind of right there on the line, like think I ran, but just a little bit less there. Like we weren't cutting off hands, heads, or, or you know, asses or anything like that. We weren't tossing people off of buildings, but you know, we were definitely legislating the Bible, which is the mark of a theocracy. And that's what these Puritan cultures were. That's what these Puritan colonies were. They were theocracies. And uh, the fact that they were theocracies and comparing that to the Constitution, how it's written, the laws that were initially, uh, or well, the amendments that were initially passed there, you can tell that plain as fucking day, it's like you got a fucking red sign and a green sign, and you're asking this mo colorblind motherfucker right here to tell the difference between the two. It's plain as day, unless you have something fucking wrong. Not to denigrate any colorblind people out there, it wasn't really a dig that was meant to, yeah, I was just using that as an example. I'm just saying 
that it's plain as day the differences between the Constitution and fucking Puritan culture. Plain as fucking day. But it's also not a coincidence, right, that the most religiously austere colony in kind of early America, which was Massachusetts, was in many ways also the de facto leader of the American Revolution, right? The most religious, most like theocratic kind of colony was the, the colony where the American Revolution started, right? That's where the first battles were fought. That's where the shot around the world was heard. That's where the American Revolution was initially the most popular, which is why the British strategically tried to move um, the the war at that time into the more secular South, right? Okay, so uh, he's mixing up a lot of things here. Okay, so the shot around the world occurred in Massachusetts, okay? And so that is kind of the Puritan area there. Uh, I don't know if I would really label them as like the, the leaders or whatnot of the revolution. I mean, that's not my area of expertise, obviously, to borrow from Dr. Josh. But uh, what, I, what I can tell you is that the uh, church attendance in the colonies was 60% in all colonies. So as far as religious adherence goes, like strict religious adherence, while the Puritan cultures, or the or Puritan colonies were stricter, they were no more like religious than other colonies. All the other colonies were set up for religious reasons. Uh, one, I've got, I've got, I've actually got a list here. Okay, so Maryland was set up specifically for Catholics fleeing the very anti-Catholic England. Virginia were Anglicans. The Carolinas were also Anglican. Let's see, Georgia. Uh, so Georgia had some religious pluralism. Let's see, its royal charter did not recognize the Church of England as the colony's official church, and it granted religious liberty to all except Roman Catholics as their dicks. Uh, settlers included Jews, Presbyterians, as well as Anglicans. So Georgia, Georgia was the, uh, I guess, less monolithically set up colony. They, they had uh, uh, different religions that were settling there, uh, uh, you know, as indicated. But the religious adherents in all the colonies were, were pretty far. So I don't know why he's like, oh, well, England wanted to shift the war down to the southern colonies because they weren't all that religious. Oh, no, I mean, it's just that the Puritans were a lot stricter up there, which I don't really think had all that much of an effect on the Revolutionary War. There was conflicting uh, feelings about the Revolutionary War all over the place. If y'all haven't seen that movie, The Patriot, which isn't all that, it's not strictly historical. I mean, it gives a pretty, a pretty clear picture of how controversial the Revolutionary War was. So, I mean, you can't sit there and be like, oh, you know, all this shit was shifted to the South because it was more secular down there. That's just bullshit. And so this is to say that Christians absolutely can advocate, for instance, today for policy. There's plenty of precedent to advocate for policy that, for instance, outlaws abortion, um, up upholds traditional marriage. OK, he's going to go through a list here. Abortion. That is a completely theological push right there. Now, there are some secular arguments for it, but as far as the laws that are being passed right now, as far as all the laws that are going to be passed or, or changed or whatnot, those are theological in nature. They are not based on science. They are not based on any secular need or anything like that. They are all theologically based. And then he said traditional marriage. That is completely theological because only in religions and theologies do you find them being like, ew, you have the same parts. That's fucking icky. Like if you don't want to get gay married, then don't get gay married. OK, like it, it, to say that, oh, that's not like that's not a theological position that that, that should be enforced. Uh, I feel like is uh, maybe maybe that's not what he's saying. Maybe he's going through this, through this entire list and he's pointing out all the things that are theological. I feel like that's giving him a little bit here, but maybe that's the direction that he's going. But traditional marriage, that is a theological thing that if they were to outlaw marriage for anybody that has the same junk parts, then uh, you would also have to outlaw interracial marriage because that is in the Bible as well. You can make a solid case for it, at least. You can make a solid case for the idea that 
you know, the races aren't supposed to mix or different nations of people aren't supposed to mix. You can make that case using the Bible. Promotes prayer in schools and reflects just other forms of generally Christian morality. Lots of examples, right? Laws like this existed at the time of our founding and our lawmakers understood this for most of American history. Just ask Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. I mean, is he known as like a austere conservative figure in history? No, but even he kind of understood this. Yet the separation of church and state folks uh, for those people who still claim that a secular government government equates a secular nation. What I would say furthermore, which, you know, I think first of all, there's a misunderstanding of separation of church and state. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hold on. If the government is secular and the, the na like what we consider the nation is the governing body of, of the country that we're in, uh, and not the individuals that make up that nation saying that our country is secular or our nation is secular. Does it mean that people in the the nation or or the country are irreligious that's not what that means jesus fucking christ he loves to play around with words here but i'd also say that the argument in itself is somewhat flawed in the sense that a nation is also more than just a government a nation is a people and the truth is that america was an overwhelmingly christian people for most of its history let's see nation a large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language inhabiting a particular country or territory. He's playing around with the the words that are being used here because when when we're talking about the separation of church and state and how we're a secular nation, we're discussing nation in the idea of, you know, this is our government, this is our country, this is our this is us as a whole, right? That's what we're talking about when we say those things. But he's playing around with the words here in order to uh, argue a very specific point that what he's talking about is the majority of people, like the the people that inhabit the nation, is what because it's like a large body of people united by common descent, uh, history, culture, or language. He's talking about the individuals within it. It's almost kind of like a composite sort of fallacy here. But what a composite fallacy is, is when you take a small piece of a whole and then you describe the entire whole as that thing, right? So if we, if we take a look at this analytically, what he's doing is he's taking a piece of the nation being the Christian population, regardless of how many people are Christian in this nation. Uh, he's taking a piece of that and he's applying it to the whole. That's the wrong way to do it because Obviously, just because even if a majority of people are Christian, that does not make the entire group a Christian nation or a Christian group of people. That's not how that works. You know, since we have people of different faiths and non-faith, you would have to describe that group of people as being secular, as being not described monolithically by religion, but one specific religion. So this is yet again another conservative self-own here because he's playing around with words to the point where he's making these very obviously illogical statements. As late as 1990, 85% of America identified as Christian. Obviously, this is a number that's been declining over time, but that's kind of where it stood, 80, 85 to 95-ish percent for most of history. Right, but you wouldn't sit there and describe the entire group as monolithically Christian. Even if you didn't want to get into the minutia of specific denominations, you would still not describe that group of people as primarily Christian or well, only Christian. That would not be a defining trait of that entire group of people. That would not be a way for you to classify that group of people by religion, right? So again, conservative cell phone here. Separation of church and state is terribly misunderstood, but even to the extent to which America's government is formerly secular, um, it is important to acknowledge that nations are not just defined by their governmental systems, right? You can make Canada, you can change the government, for instance, in Canada, you can make that into a dictatorship or a communist or whatever you wanna do it, it would still be Canada, right? Because nations are defined more, more by more than just what the government is there. Okay, I'm not sure what the point he's trying to make here. Like you can change Canada to a dictatorship and that doesn't mean it's not Canada no more. So, I mean, is he trying to say, well, we can turn America into a theocracy, but that doesn't make it, you know, not America, I guess is the point that he's saying. Um, and they're arguably more so defined by the places they exist and the people who live there than the governments. And so the American people have undeniably been a Christian people with a Christian culture and a Christian land for most of history. It doesn't matter if a majority of the population 
for a majority of the time has been Christian. That doesn't matter at all. The, the fact that we allow other religions to exist uh, within our nation, the fact that we have people that are not defined by any kind of religion means that you can't use religion to classify us as a people because we have such diverse views on it. And even saying that, oh, it's a Christian nation, it's like, well, what kind of Christian? You've got Baptists, you've got new independent fundamentalist dipshits, you've got Catholics, you've got that whatever that fundy shit is the the, hand, the Justice Handmaid is in. You've got that gun, that gun fucking group, uh, I, I think over there in Pennsylvania, that, uh, you know, worships guns. You've got people that, uh, that are Muslim. You've got people that are Jews. You've got people that are Hindus. I mean, you've got all of these different ideas as far as religion goes. So, I mean, that means that you cannot classify us monolithically by religion, but that's what this guy's wanting to do. He's wanting to say that we are a Christian nation because there's one, no wall of separation of church and state, which is bullshit as we've seen. And two, because we've, uh, the people of this nation have been a majority Christian. That doesn't matter. What matters is, is how our government is set up, how our nation is set up as a, an, an entire group. That's what matters in this situation. This particular topic gets me really riled up. As y'all can tell, I had to scream multiple times, but all in all, for Vince's uh, video here. So for Vince Dow's uh, video here, I did not find any kind of compelling argument that we are indeed a Christian nation and that the wall of separation of church and state does not exist. We sat there and we read through Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist where he clearly lays out that the government can't enforce any kind of religious legislation on its people. The government can't control religions and religions can't control the government. That's exactly what he's saying. And you cannot only have half of that equation. You have to have that entire equation because as soon as you have a religion that's legislating theological beliefs onto its people and onto the churches, you have already violated that one half that you are willing to have, that you're willing to give us. So no matter what, Vince, you're fucked in your argument. But in your argument, you're fucked and you can't make a coherent argument. What he had to do was appeal to people that didn't help set up our government. He even misrepresented a few of them, misrepresented what they meant by saying this is a Christian nation, nation in some shit. The one being Justice Brewer. That guy doesn't want to tell you that Justice Brewer actually consider the state and religion to be independent of one another, which is a clear separation of church and state. So all in all, Vince is just lying to you. He's cherry picking the information in order to make his argument. But a simple look at the actual history of our nation will show that it is not a Christian nation and that there is supposed to be a wall of separation between church and state. No matter what the boofer, the handmaid, uh, Uncle Thomas Clarence, over there, Gorsuch, whatever the fuck his name is, Alito, any of them, no matter what they say, this is not a Christian nation.